The box office for this summer is in collapse. June is down the drains and it's all due to Disney. Well, Disney and a few others, The Flash is definitely taking some flack. But the bottom line is this, theaters and theater owners are desperate to find something that will win and they are sick of the woke. They're now demanding that these companies switch over to something that will bring in customers once again. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning seems to be just that. But how long must they wait? Well, they've got to slog through Indy first. And we're talking about this past weekend right now as we do a post-mortem on the worst box office weekend of all time. All right, folks, welcome back to another fantastic day here on the WDW Pro channel. It is a joy each time you join us. We love having you. Your day is important. Your time is important. And what an honor it is to share it with you. Well, folks, if you like content like this, consider clicking the like button, share, subscribe, and you can stick it to the algorithms when you click it. We're talking about that notification bell. Joining me to talk about the box office disaster that was this last weekend is the one and only investigative reporter for ThatParkPlace.com, Jonas J. Campbell. Welcome back, sir. Hey, it's good to be here on a Monday afternoon. I hope everybody's weekend was fantastic, or at least more fantastic than it was for the box office. Well, you know, the theater owners out there, Jonas, they are happy that it's Monday because at least it's better than being this past weekend. As we talked about before on this channel, when adjusted for inflation, you have to go all the way back to June of 1994 to find a worse summer box office weekend. And let me tell you this, after the numbers are in, indeed, this weekend that we just went through turns out to be worse. So it has been an awful, awful time for movie theater owners, for the companies, etc. And they're all tired of the studios putting out content that is driving away customers. Let's hop straight into this article out of Variety by Rebecca Rubin. I can't wait to hear your take on all of this, Jonas. It says, Spider-Verse returns to number one. Folks, that is a, that is a movie that has been out for a month. Spider-Man re uh, returns to number one as The Flash collapses by 73%. All the more impressive given the fact that, well, it had already collapsed in its first weekend. So it had no room to fall, and yet it did. And Jennifer Lawrence's No Hard Feelings opens to 15 million. Folks, you're not confused if you notice that Elemental is missing. There's a reason. Let's get into it. Somewhere across the multiverse, The Flash, once touted by its own studio as one of the greatest superhero movies of all time, ouch, what a dig, should be towering over the box office with ease in its second weekend of release. But in this universe, audiences are flat out rejecting the Warner Brothers movie starring Ezra Miller as the eponymous timeline-spanning speedster. Now that's alliteration. Rather than taking a victory lap, the DC comic book adventure is cratering in third place behind holdovers, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, and Pixar's Elemental and ever so slightly ahead of Jennifer Lawrence's new R-rated comedy, Hard R, folks, No Hard Feelings. Jonas, we knew The Flash was bad. We thought Michael Keaton might be able to prop it up. It's not happening. Well, that's an understatement. Um, this thing is roadkill. It's not, it's not The Flash at all. It's not speeding anywhere. It is deader than dead. What has happened? I, I think that uh, we've finally reached peak member berry with the flash uh to where the entire thing is is leaning on the idea hey do you remember this other film do you remember this other film do you remember how good you felt like that do you remember how much you hated it but you forgot how much you hated it and then got nostalgic because everything bad came out after it i feel like the flash is is right at the crux of this the ultimate movie as the repudiation of of just trying to get people in for nostalgia and and it it, it soundly I love that idea. shot down Mm. I love that idea that the member berries have soured. I love that idea. We will have to do a video on that at some point. Have the member berries soured. But I love the idea, Jonas, that they can no longer make movies where they say, remember when we used, when we used to be good? Remember when we used to be good? Remember when we could, could make this kind of stuff? It's not working anymore. And, and let's talk about Ezra Miller, though. Let's go there. Jonas, how bad did Ezra Miller hurt the, uh, the franchise with his casting? I'll tell you two people that I've come up with so far who would be worse. Well, three. Here are three people that could have possibly been worse than Ezra Miller, although perhaps not. Paul Rubin, who played Pee Wee Herman. At this age, maybe a worse pick than Ezra Miller. Josh Gad, the fluffy uh, voice of Olaf, potentially worse than, than uh, Ezra Miller. And Lizzo, although she has really made a huge difference in Star Wars, probably a worse pick than Ezra Miller. 
that's the only three I can come up with. How badly did this hurt the film? I, uh, it, it definitely didn't help the film. I, I think the problem with the flash marketing is that you have no engaging character to put forward except for Michael Keaton. Uh, they didn't put Sasha Kaye or Callie. I don't know which uh, pronunciation that they're going with here for this, this apparently lovely woman who they've brought in to be the uh, replacement for Henry Cavill. But wait, there's more. Uh, they're, they're actually ending that universe anyways. <laughs> Yes, and replacing Henry Cavill without a with proper without a proper send off that's a that's a great way to draw on audiences. So, right, they, they've they've missed out on the important element of most superhero films is that you have to make the superhero themselves someone to root for, and if you don't have them talk, you don't have them do press. Uh, that suspension of disbelief uh, to where they take, oh, this is really this what this is is this is Jack Black in Star Wars. All they see is Jack Black. They don't see uh, Prince Bombardier or whatever his name was. Uh, if it's Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man, they're seeing a little bit of Robert Downey Jr. Maybe they're rooting for a comeback here. Uh, with, with Ezra Miller, they got nothing. They just got this weird, very Hollywood person who seems to be, uh, he, if he's not an elitist, he's someone that the elitists like. And I couldn't tell you anything positive about him. I don't know. All I have is the news stories that seem to indicate he's not such a great person. Well, that's the sort of person you really want to cast twice in a movie, like uh, Mike Myers playing Austin Powers and Dr. Evil, or uh, Jaleel White playing Steve Urkel and his cousin Merkel. That's really the kind of person you want to have double on screen is Ezra Miller. So great picks there. But uh, <laughs> Jonas, this is one of the most damning paragraphs you could possibly see. Let's read it for fun. Over the weekend, The Flash suffered a brutal 73% decline in its second weekend with $15.3 million dollars from 4,265 North American theaters. By the way, folks, if you want to know why the theater owners are angry, go ahead and do the math and figure out how much that comes out to per theater, and you'll get an idea. That's a far bigger drop than recent DC adaptations like Black Adam and Shazam! Fury of the Gods. And here's what we need to note here, Jonas. It was just a few months ago that Dwayne The Rock Johnson was the butt of jokes across Hollywood. People wondered if his star had faded as Black Adam was unable to do anything tremendous at all. Now, The Flash wishes it was Black Adam. They would love to have a Black Adam right now versus this, this stinker. How bad have we fallen off where Black Adam is now seen as a winner versus what we have? You, you know what's fascinating, too, is that Black Adam, uh, there was a time at which uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson said, no, I don't think we're even going to have to wait until 2019 to get this Black Adam movie. Uh and, and here we are. It's uh, the 2020s, and uh, it just came out uh, not that long ago. I mean, obviously, we're talking a, a little bit farther than The Flash, but uh, that movie was definitely not nearly as expensive as The Flash. No, not even close. I mean, The Flash has been made for 10 years. This thing's been going on for a decade now. In the case of The Flash, it's a catastrophic result for the $200 million budgeted tentpole. Folks, that's what it was originally budgeted for. That is not the final budget, as we said. I suppose that's what it was budgeted for back in like 2016. Because it signals that ticket sales won't rebound in its theatrical run. So far, the film has generated a lousy $87 million at the domestic box office and $123.3 million internationally. By the way, when the international number is bigger than the domestic number by a lot, that's worse for the studios because they get a smaller percentage back after all the cuts have been had for taxes, for theaters, etc. So it's even worse. Bringing the worldwide total $210.9 million. Part of the problem is the new leaders at DC Comics, James Gunn and Peter Safran, have announced plans to reset the flailing comic book universe. Yes, let's blame them. They're the ones who are at fault. Has nothing to do with Ezra Miller and the people who actually made this movie before they came in. Let's just skip that paragraph. That's that's the punishment, Rebecca. All right. And then we get into uh, Praise of the Spider-Man, Spider-Verse movie, 19.3, fourth weekend. Of course, that's good. But here's where we get back into the bad. The Spider-Verse sequel narrowly beat out Disney and Pixar's animated Elemental, which remained in second place with $18.5 million. That brings its domestic tally to $65 million and global total to $121. Ticket sales in its sophomore outing were stronger than anticipated. Oh, <laughs> yes, so strong. I love these sub-$20 million weekends that are stronger than anticipated, dropping Ooh. only 37% from the prior weekend. Unfortunately for Elemental, it landed, by far, the worst start in modern history for Pixar. And you know what? Jonas, we need to give a little credit to Rebecca for this one. Um, she's right. 
And the people out there who are writing these articles about how it is overcoming Onward, they are being at best disingenuous because Onward was yanked from theaters. You really can't count it. It was pulled from theaters due to the pandemic. So using it, it wasn't, as a barometer doesn't work. Yes, and it wasn't even given the chance to be given a uh, premiere. I do believe it just went straight on to the uh, regular tier of Disney+. Plus. That's right. So it'll need to remain the de facto choice for family audiences to justify its $200 million price tag and restore a little confidence in the Pixar brand. Folks, that is not going to happen. Its production budget is estimated to be about $200 million. Its marketing budget, let us it, it was low, but at the least, let's say it's 100 That means it needs $600 million to break even, essentially. And this movie will be lucky to break 250 total, total, for its full worldwide box office run. In fact, if it hits 200 at this point, I'll be surprised. So Jonas Pixar has fallen. Um, they are out there, though pushing narratives about their non-binary water characters, their first uh, <laughs> non-binary aquatic creatures. Congratulations to them. It's a huge milestone. But how much did uh, how much did the woke ideology damage this film, and how much has the degradation of Disney's values in the eyes of families harmed this movie? Well, the important thing to know is that uh, with Elemental, there might have been some people that checked to see online whether or not this film was going to be woke, but I think the damage was done uh, several years ago with uh, the the slight uh, uh, the slight dissonance of family values with Turning Red and the huge dissonance of family values with the uh, anti-white, anti-family, uh, anti-equality uh, light year. I, I think well, there was I a forget, strange world. It, oh. it, it knocked them out too, even though it's non-Pixar. Who can tell the difference? Right. The the entire climax of Strange World, when you uh, pay attention to it, is uh, having the old uh, boomer, if not older, uh, father embrace uh, diversity and disability and having his wife uh, get married to another man, even though they never actually stopped being married. Uh, they're uh, just, just bizarre repudiation of of traditional, uh, you say that the men, the rugged individuals that uh, explored and, and founded countries, uh, those guys, they've got to go away. Uh, and on that note, I, folks, get ready for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. You're going to love it. Wait till you see Fleabag take a, take a hit on Indy. All right, folks, we've got one more paragraph to read about this abysmal box office, the worst possibly in the modern movie era. Of course, we're only going back to 1975 when we're looking for that because we only want to compare summers where the, the idea of the summer blockbuster actually was a real thing. Now, some people are being a little harsh with uh, Jennifer Lawrence's raunchy, raunchy comedy, No Hard Feelings. Others are praising it and saying that it's, uh, you know, it's doing well. And I'm here to tell you that many are missing what's happening completely. This movie was not sent to theaters with the idea that it would do well there. This movie was never greenlit on the hopes that its box office would do well. There's an eight second uh, scene in this film in which Jennifer Lawrence uh, has forgotten some of her apparel. In fact, all of it. And I'm here to tell you that that probably was part of the original pitch to get this thing through. And the idea is that eventually this will make it into uh, premiere streaming. It'll make it into physical media. And they're hoping that uh, the, the young men and perhaps women, who knows out there, will be buying this Simply for that eight-second scene, I'm not here to make an ethical judgment one way or the other, although I would say that uh, uh, I, <laughs> we'll just leave it there, but that's what's happening. So this $45 million uh, that they budgeted for it with $15 million coming in on the first weekend, you would say, well, it's not going to make back its money. That's not where their money is being made, and folks out there, you all can decide whether you think that is a moral or immoral, ethical or un unethical business practice, but ultimately this is in the same kind of category as American Pie movies where they're trying to get young people to buy it later on for that purpose. Well, Jonas, you can almost guarantee at this point it will have an unrated physical media edition of some kind. Oh, absolutely. That's that's definitely baked into it. But Jonas, this, this brings us to, again, the worst box office in modern movie history for the summer. We're not including August. We're not including September because... Those are not traditionally part of the summer movie system. They're, they're summer months, uh, given, 
given that they exist inside the summer, but they're when kids go back to school. For Memorial Day weekend until the end of July, this is the worst that we've ever seen since 1975 adjusted for inflation. What do we have to do to get the audience to return to theaters? Let's ignore for a moment that we think that will happen with Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, but Jonas, what are these studios like Disney going to have to do to restore trust and to restore excitement to the idea, the proposition of going to the cinemas? Well, the uh, the classic strategy here is to find someone who's doing it successfully and then to just buy them, which I, I, I believe Iger's hands are tied. <laughs> this is the most cynical response you have ever had, Jonas. I was expecting some some uh, uh, thesis on, on values and morals and, and giving people what they wanted. You came up with... They'll simply buy the little guy who's doing it right. <laughs> when, I love when you, the answer, though. You're exactly right. I just wasn't <laughs> expecting it. I, I think at this point, it's going to take it's going to take five years of clean films before <laughs> they can get people back to the box office, and it will take they five will buy, years. Of, they will buy the little studio that's doing it right. Use them for two or three years. Defile them. Corrupt them. Have them turn into them and do it all over again. Yeah, I love the answer. It's the cycle. We look at Pixar now. You look at Marvel now. You look at Star Wars now. Um, there is nothing that they purchase that they own outright that has not been corrupted. Thank goodness that Bluey, which by the way, it has been confirmed by Joe Brum that Disney does through the BBC and ABC, Australian Broadcasting Company, have some level of influence, I guess, with an asterisk on Bluey. But man, the best thing that has happened to them as far as children's entertainment is the fact that they cannot touch Bluey in any effective way. So uh, think about that, Bob. If anybody's watching this video, why is it that the stuff that Disney has an influence over is doing so horribly at the box office? And then maybe reflect upon yourself. That's a good. That's a good comment, Jonas. And I think theater owners all over the world are saying, "Dang it, Bob! Dang it, Bob!" <laughs> Mexican Iron Man for the win. That's right. We love uh, Mexican Iron Man. Mike over here on this channel does a great job for so many channels. And folks, we love all of you too. We're happy that you joined us for this discussion. We are hopeful that things will turn around. We are not here to just be negative and pessimistic. No. We see a golden horizon ahead. It's just not for Disney. Tom Cruise will be cruising back into theaters with Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. We believe that will do quite well. And yet again, set the standard and tell people that that type of content, we're talking about the Top Gun Maverick stuff, we're talking about Avatar The Way of Water, we're talking about Sonic the Hedgehog, we're talking about Mario, we're talking about the kind of movies that have made money. Heck, we'll even throw Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse in there if you want us to. But that's the, the type of content people want, not what Disney has been doing. And folks, if you like us attempting to tell the truth over here, help us out by clicking that like button, share, subscribe. And when you click it, you stick it to the algorithms. It's the notification bell. If you are not yet a member of this channel for the price of a soda, you get access to all kinds of exclusive content. So consider it by clicking the join button. The Pro Show Live is Thursdays, 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Thursday evenings, every single Thursday. We have a panel of great guests here to dissect entertainment explain it, and keep you ahead of the culture curve. So folks, before we go, Jonas, tell them, where can they find you? Well, you can either find me here on the Pro Show on Thursdays, 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern, or I'm an investigative reporter for That Park Place, or I have my own channel where I like to dig through the content that uh, companies like Disney make and, and point out all the things that parents would like to know that are in their children's uh, entertainment that might be trying to change the way they view the world. We will be breaking. Hit it is. We will be breaking all sorts of news this week. We will also be having a midnight special live stream launch. That's midnight Eastern time uh, when we review Indiana Jones: The Dial of Destiny. It is our philosophical and principled position here that we do not watch movies before their release date lest any of you fear that we have been influenced by the studios in giving us early access. No, we will wait until Indy is out and then we will review it for all of you. Be watching for that live stream. You're not going to want to miss it. And folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, keep learning, keep growing, and keep having fun. Say it ain't so. This just in. Disney lost money on another movie. Why, that can't be. I 
I thought that John Lasseter fella over at Pixar was cranking out the latest hits and Marvel was unstoppable and Disney princesses were a thing and Star Wars was a multi-billion dollar money-making franchise. I overheard you talking about Disney and wanted to let you know you're really behind the ball. If you were uh, getting great articles from thatparkplace.com and subscribe to WDW Pro's YouTube channel, you'd actually be ahead of the culture curve and have entertainment explained. <laughs>